kids head to their class. So I was looking around trying to figure out, you know, what happened to this fish? Is it hiding under a rock? Is it in a bush? Is it, um, you know, did, did it dump out somewhere? And I couldn't find this fish for the longest time until I started to think about, you know, what I was doing a little bit about my, my surroundings, my, um, well, it came to my attention that there was something squishy on the bottom of my foot. Now, I was um, chasing this fish aquarium and uh, so I picked up my foot, and on my heel is this little squished fish, and his little mouth was open, and he was just right there <laughs> on, the, on the heel of my foot. I was like, oh, man, this stinks. This is so awful. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm going to scrape him off and throw him into the water. Maybe he'll come back. I don't know. I scraped him off, threw him into the water, and of course... <laughs> nothing there, right? I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? I just killed this fish. There's nothing I can do about it. I felt horrible. Like, what kind of a, a caretaker am I that I just squish my own pet with my foot, right? How good is this? And I, as I'm thinking through Ephesians chapter 2, the, um, the death that we uh, experience before we come to know Jesus is like, just like the way that that fish was squished on by my foot, there was, there was no life there. Couldn't bring it back. It was dead. Not partially dead. Not just mostly dead. But it was dead. And that's what we find in Ephesians chapter 2. This morning, um, we're going to look at those first 11 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. If I had a proposition this morning, a main idea that I want you to take away from the message this morning is that God's grace transforms us. His grace transforms us. And so, before we get into our text this morning, uh, let's pray together, and then we'll, we'll go through our text. God, we are so thankful that you love us, and that you loved us even before we were uh, lovely, even before there's anything that we could bring or offer. Father, that even in our death, our dead state, you saw fit to redeem us and to love us and to show us mercy and grace. Father, I pray that today you would help us as we seek to understand these, these verses and this text and uh, we want to uh, apply the truth of your word to our lives. I pray that you give us wisdom and understanding. I pray that you would um, help us to walk away with a greater appreciation for the grace that you've shown to us. I pray that you would um, better equip us for praising you and understanding the grace that you've extended towards us. Father, I pray that uh, as I speak this morning, you would help me to communicate clearly. I pray that it would be easily understood that um, your word would be um, able to uh, work in our hearts to convict us and to challenge us. 
you, help me not to say anything that would distract from the truth of your word, help me not to say anything that would take away from uh, what you want to communicate through your word this morning. And I pray that you would um, help us to walk out of here different than where we came in. Thank you for giving us this uh, privilege of being able to um, meet with you. Help us now as we we study your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, this morning, point number one is that you were dead. We see that in the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. I'll begin reading verse 1. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. First thing we see this morning is that you are dead. In our trespasses and sins, the uh, question comes up as we look at this first verse, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, is uh, which comes first? Is it is it that the, the trespasses and sins are what make us dead, or is it that we're dead and therefore we trespass and sin? And I think this morning as we look at the, uh, this text, as we see the, the nature of ourselves, we see that um, who we are before Christ, our sonship, it leads us to understand that um, it's not the trespasses and sins that make us dead, but it's that we are dead, and because of our death, we trespass and we sin against God. So death, um, let me just point out again, death means completely dead, not half dead, not a par partial death, it means dead, right? It's like that fish that I scraped off my foot. There was nothing I could do to make that fish come back alive, right? And uh, it was dead, right? This is who we were. And so what do dead people do? Well, it's all expressed right here for us in the first three verses. Dead people do these things. First of all, they walk according to the course of this world. They walk according to the prince, the power of the air. And so this is kind of the, the mode of operation for those who are dead. They walk according to the course of this world. They follow after what the fallen world sees as good. Walking according to the prince, the power of the air. This is a, a reference to the devil. We're told that this is the, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience. That, um, that birth is paralleled, I mentioned already, that it's paralleled with the nature that we are given, that we have. So what essentially is... Uh, the, um, what Paul is saying here is that you look like your parents. Um, a lot of kids in our church, and if you look at those kids, you say, oh, okay, that kid goes to that person, and I can see how they, how they look, look alike. Look at my boys, you say, oh, these are brothers. They go together. We can see how this works. Well, as, um, as sons of disobedience, we take after that uh, disobedience. The sons of disobedience, they're um, compared to, in some ways, those um, who are walking in darkness. And we'll look at a few verses to talk about this. This, this phrase, the son, uh, sons of disobedience, it, it also comes up in Ephesians chapter 5. What does Paul say in Ephesians 5, verse 6, 7, and 8? 
In Ephesians 5, verse 6, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. So here we have this, this comparison, the sons of disobedience being those who are walking in darkness. And those who are uh, sons of God, they walk in the light. And so the question then is, well, okay, if there's this darkness that people are walking in, what causes them to be in darkness? Or what, um, what's the progression to get them to that state? And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, a key passage that deals with this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds, again, the God of this world, the devil, we see that partnered with this, um, this prince of the power of the air. It says, um, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So just as God spoke light into existence in the beginning, right? He speaks light into existence. That is the same power, and he has the same authority to speak life into the dead, or to speak light into the dark heart. Okay, what does this mean? I think one of the implications here is that the, the light of Christ is not something that every person possesses. It's not something that we have within ourselves. It is not something that you're born with. But this is, salvation is a work of God. This is something that God does in us. We also see that these dead people, they walk, they're active according to the course of the world, they walk according to prince of the power of the air. These dead people, they are also living, dead, but living in the lusts of their flesh, as it says. Let me get back to Ephesians here. It says in verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So those who, you know, before Christ, this is who we were. We were living in the lusts of our flesh. We were indulging in the desires of the flesh, of the mind. Romans 8 comes to mind. Uh, verse 6, it says, For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. This is what it is to walk in darkness. You do not subject yourself. You're not humbling yourself and following what God says is good. For it is not even able to do so. You're not able to please God in the flesh. It says, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So by nature, we are children of wrath, even as the rest of mankind, Paul says, we're dead. We were dead, right? As a follower of Christ. And those who are dead, they walk in darkness. They follow after this world. They follow after the devil. They do the deeds of the flesh. This is what it is to be dead. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? You want another fish picture? There was one time, I'll tell you another story. One time my family, we decided we were going to go on vacation. Now vacation and pets, they're always a little bit tricky, right? I remember one time I was trying to consolidate fish into one aquarium so that I could put a bunch of little feeders and stuff in that aquarium so that the fish would stay alive while I was gone on vacation. And I thought, ah, surely this will be okay. It's only for a few days. But what I didn't realize was that the aggressive fish got more aggressive when the less aggressive fish got partnered with them. And so I came back from my trip 
and uh, looked into the aquarium and it was this disgusting mess of uh, the aggressive fish. They weren't nice and happy. And it was all the leftovers of the non-aggressive fish. And there was these like little skeletons and it was this, they, it was, they were dead, right? And um, I, again, like these, the smell was awful, right? These things are gross. Before Jesus, that's who we were. We were gross. We were dead. There was no life, right? And so I point this out because verse 4 comes at a transition. It says, but God, and let me point out that this but God is not to erase all that comes before, but this but God is to highlight and contrast all that, is to, all that God has done. We recognize the disgustingness of death the, the wrongness of it, the way that it pains us, we know something isn't right in death. And so in this spiritual death, we see, oh, this is, this is not the relationship with God that was intended or that um, was to be. But God steps in. And here we get a glimpse into the height of God's holiness as we recognize the depths of man's death. We see his grace at work. We see in verse 4 that he is merciful. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, he was rich in mercy, meaning that he doesn't give us what we deserve. What does a dead person deserve? Well, you'd be buried, right? There's nothing there. Like they don't deserve anything. The good news of the gospel is spelled out in these two words of mercy and grace. From God, mercy is extended towards us. The question is why? Why would God do such a thing? I think we see it in the text. We see that He is loving. And this is in line with His character. His mercy, His love, His grace is all in line with His character. It is what defines Him as God. So we don't want to mess this up. We don't want to miss this because we're seeing who God is in the way that he acts in his character. This is what separates God from all other gods. All other religions, they would say, well, there is something here for you to achieve. There is a work to be done. There's something you must add to this equation in order to be seen as favorable to God. And this is what sets God apart from all the all-you-can-do religions. He says, I'm going to show you mercy. Instead of showing you judgment, instead of giving you what you deserve, I'm going to be merciful to you. Why does he do this? He does it because he is loving. Verse 4 and 5. Verse 5 continues, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Because of his great love, and his love is great, isn't it? How great is his love? Well, that's a good question, right? I can tell you this much. It is greater than the weight of all of my sin. It is greater than the weight of all of your sin. It is greater than the weight of all of our sin combined. His love is deep. He is loving, and he has shown us mercy out of love. And so even when we were dead... <clears throat> You know how hard it is to love a dead thing, right? Even when you, we were dead, He loved us. A dead thing can offer nothing to Him. It can produce nothing. We see again these hints from Romans. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 it says, But God demonstrated His own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. And so we see God is merciful. We also see that God is loving. And in this redemption plan of extending mercy and grace to us, He unites us with Christ. As the passage continues, He makes us alive together with Christ. Notice the different things that, are, that we're partnered with Christ in as we go from verse 5 um, to verse 7. 
Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'll stop there. And so we are united with Christ. We're made alive together with Christ. And that to be made alive means that we're no longer under the bondage of the previous sin that had control over us. No longer under its control. No longer does it have power over us. This is what gives the Christian hope. Uh, we have the ability to have victory. And so He has made us alive together with Christ. He has raised us up with Him. He has seated us with Him in the heavenly places. And when we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, you can see where He's getting this stuff. He says in Ephesians 1, 20, which He had brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. This is what God did for Jesus and then in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, this is what God does for you because you are partnered with Christ. Through your faith in Him. I remember uh, one time we were visiting in North Carolina and we were, um, my wife and I were walking around the streets of Graham, the booming metropolis, a little, little town there. And uh, I had a friend who saw me. He was working at the courthouse and he said, hey, do you guys want to come in? I'll give you a tour of the courthouse. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Sure. And so he took us in and showed us all the different little chambers and different areas. And, and um, it was a neat little visit with that, uh, that friend. Now, apart from that friend, I would not have been able to get into those rooms to see those places. But because I was with this friend, he says, okay, you can come with me. I've got the authority and the ability to unlock this door to show you this area. I remember also uh, when I was younger, um, I would go, I had a buddy who worked at an ice cream shop. I would go and visit this ice cream shop because my buddy worked there and he would give me free ice cream. I was like, this is awesome. But it's all because I had a buddy that was there that I was able to gain access to that free ice cream. What's going on here? In this passage, when we're partnered with Christ, it's like we're with Jesus and Jesus steps in now and he says, hey, hey, that guy's with me. Give him some ice cream. All right, that guy's with me. He has access to these things. This is what God has done for us. He unites us with Christ, and we have the blessings of being in Christ. Why does he do this? Why would he take something that was dead, make it alive, and then give it these blessings, give you these blessings? Verse 7. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. You become a testimony of the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Through God's redeeming you, he not only reveals his character today, but in the ages to come, you become a continual example of the grace of God. Now let that marinate for a minute because this is big, right? God saved you not just for today for you to have that relationship for Him or with Him, but He has saved you so that in the ages to come, you are a representation of His grace. You reveal something about the character of God because He has made you to be that. the immeasurable riches, the surpassing riches of His grace are made known through His saving you. So His love is displayed through Christ by grace to make us in Christ the recipients of His kindness to declare His glorious grace. Under His grace, we are changed. We are transformed that but God in verse 4 is an act of God to give us life. And this change means what? What does this mean for the believer? This is a big deal, right? It means that no longer do I have to operate controlled by my lust. No longer do I have to hold on to bitterness. 
No longer do I have to see myself as a victim. No longer do I have to be afraid of uncertainty. No longer am I plagued by regret. No longer captive to what other people think about me. No longer enslaved to the approval of others. The list continues. But what he has done is he has separated you from all those things that you wanted to be, trying to worry about those things. He said, now you are a representation of who I am, the grace that is extended, and you show this grace. The mercy, love, grace of God is defined by God himself. As it says, we know love by this, right? This is what mercy and grace look like. He has done according to his character. Therefore, he is not only worthy of praise because of what he has done, but he, but he is worthy of praise because of who he is. Who he is is on display in his saving you. This is a big deal. This is a grace of God. The third thing we see this morning is that we were created to live unto good works. So it doesn't stop right there, but it keeps on going. Yeah, I, he's gracious in saving you. Wonderful. He gives you life. That's wonderful. And then he goes a step further and he says, all right, now I'm going to use you to be a, a display of this grace. And then he builds on top of that by saying, actually, I've created these good works for you to walk in. More praise, more glory given to God because of the way that he's able to use you. Verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This is a gift from God. This is how we're saved. It is by grace through faith, not of ourselves. That refers back to the saving act. It refers back to the, the um, by grace you have been saved through faith. And so this salvation, this act of God is recognized as an act of God, and he's given this gift. How awkward would it be for you to be at a birthday party and someone then tries to pay for the gift that they are given? How insulting would it be if you say, hang on a minute, uh, what's this worth? Let me give you some money for this. How insulting that... God would give his only begotten son th that you would think that you could offer something that would be equal in value to God's son. Equal in value to Jesus Christ's death. How insulting. This is a gift. And boy, are we thankful that it's a gift because there's nothing that we have that is valued at all, right? Filthy rags. That's our righteousness, right? This is what God has done in giving us this gift. You can't boast about it. Verse 9 tells us, you're not saved by works for this reason, so that no one will boast. You can't brag about yourself. If you could somehow attain God's favor through your deeds, then we could very easily boast in ourselves in relation to other people. Hey, look at how great I am. I helped five old ladies across the street this week, and you only did four. Come on, man. Right? If you could attain God's favor through the things that you do, then you could boast about those things. I think um, within our family, our boys, we have a lot of fun uh, because there's a lot of competition that goes on, right? There's competition in jumping and running and strength and eating, you know, you name, you name it. Their abilities um, make them no more my son or no less my son. That is the way it is with God. 
You can't earn his favor. As his child, you are his child. He loves you. He has shown mercy to you. He has shown grace towards you. And then he continues, the things that you do, I've already put them together. He goes one step more. God not only takes away your ability to earn his favor, but he also prepared the good works for you to walk in. And here's where you see these, the bookends of these first 11 verses. What were you before? You were dead, and you are walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. That's how you walked then. And now, as a follower of Jesus, you walk in these good deeds, the things that God has prepared for you. There's a difference there. Through faith in Jesus, we're able to walk in good works, not so that we might boast about these things, but so that God might be glorified through us. We can be, we can be tempted to think that our works can merit favor from God, but apart from Christ, our good works are futile. I was thinking of an illustration, what might illustrate the way that this works, and I was thinking of maybe a, a photographer. Uh, picture yourself as a photographer. You go into work, and in that day, you're in the Photoshop, you're working, you're taking pictures, you're um, setting up backgrounds, you're making sure the lighting is right, you're working diligently to help customers get the perfect shot after their wedding party, uh, you're, you're working with the, these firstborn, birth, uh, firstborn babies or these uh, first birthdays. You're taking pictures of engagements, maybe graduation photos, maybe family photos. You've worked very hard all day. At the end of the day, you're able to look at these photos and you look at the rest of your coworkers and you say, wow, look at how many photos I took. I did a really good job. I have way more photos. I work more diligently than everybody else in the shop. And then the boss says, hey, uh, I would like to meet with you. And so you go into his office, and he says, all right, I see the things you did. You're fired. You're like, what? I'm fired? How can I be fired? I did more than anybody else. I took all of these photos. How can I be fired? And he says, yeah, but look at the photos. And you realize that in every single photo, you put your finger in front of the lens. So in every photo, there's this marred mess of a blur. Says you're an awful photographer. Right? This is what it is like for us to come before God and say, hey, look at all the things that I've done. It's so wonderful. But it all gets so tainted with our own sin, the death, transgressions. So he is the one who puts it together for us. He says, all right, so you guys messed this up. Now let me put these things together. I'm going to give you these good deeds. I'm going to prepare them beforehand so that you might walk in them. As I mentioned before, the only thing that we bring to God is filthy rags. We bring him photos of fingers. His salvation is a gift question this morning is, have you received that gift? If you've received that gift, then the next question is, are you operating in grace? Or are you going back to the old way of thinking and saying, um, but I have to do this thing in order to be righteous? God has given us victory, and through His grace, we're able to step away from all the sins that, uh, that entangle us, that weigh us down. It is in his giving of life that we're able to have victory. And so we're able to walk in that victory. One of the other things that comes up in this passage that I haven't really addressed so far is that when Paul is speaking, he uses these different, um, uh, different pronouns, way of talking about who he's, uh, the audience he's mentioning, right? He begins in verse 1, he says, And you... We're dead in your trespasses and sins. And I think what's going on here, as we look later on as in verse 11, and I have to mention this because he gets into this in the upcoming verses, 
is that he, he goes back and forth between talking to the Gentile audience and talking to the Jewish audience. And I think what he's doing in the beginning is he's pointing to you, the Gentiles, and he's saying, this is your problem. These are all the problems with the Gentiles. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, and all the Jews are like, yeah, this is what we've been saying. And he's saying, yeah, you Jews are right. These people are walking this way. But then he continues in verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. And he lumps the Jews into this sinful goop. And so he, he points these things out. And I think, first of all, they're realizing, okay, he's right about the world. And then he just kind of pokes them. And you're just like them. There's much for us to learn from the way that Paul deals with the Jews and the Gentiles. Very quickly and very easily, we can become just like the Jews and thinking that we are righteous because of the things that we've done. God is the one who makes us righteous through Jesus. It is a gift of His grace. Nobody can boast. And so we rejoice in God's salvation. And this morning, my challenge is simply to walk in the good works that God has prepared for you. Operate in victory as He has given you life. Evaluate yourself and ask the question, am I, am I tempted to think in some area of my life that I'm better than somebody else because of the things that I do? Is there some... Is there some way that I think that I'm maybe a little bit better than my neighbor or coworker, that I might be a little bit more righteous because of this thing or that thing? Or are we just sold into recognizing God as our Savior? And this is one of those things that... Um, it doesn't happen overnight where you're like, boom, okay, new creature, made alive, I'm perfect now, right? But you have the ability now to please God. And by His grace and through His work in our lives, He reveals these things to us like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have thought of myself that way because it, it was prideful. Or maybe I shouldn't have compared myself with that person because that goes against what the gospel says. So this morning we are put in a position to think and to ponder, to pray. Ask God if there's some way in your life that you have stepped away from the good news of God's grace, His love, and His mercy. And instead you've started to focus on the things that you can do. A way that you could pay for a gift. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you and your love saw fit to show mercy towards us who were dead. Father, I thank you that you have put us in a place where we cannot brag, we cannot be boastful in the things that we do because you are the one who is both the giver of our salvation and the one who enables us to operate in love towards you. God, I pray that you would help us to do that. Help us to have uh, a proper motivation in the things that we do. I pray that you would help us to be, uh, to be different from this world. Help us not to fall into the mentality of this world and and the way that uh, people think of the, um, the competitive um, advancement of uh, careers or a position in society or of power. Thinking one person's better than the other because of the amount of money that they make. Father, I thank you that we can rejoice in that we know you and that you have given us grace, that you have shown us mercy that you have been loving towards us, that we are now able to be a reflection of that grace for, 
in the ages to come that we might bring you glory. And Father, I pray that you would help us on the, on the daily basis uh, to pursue you and walk in those good deeds that you've prepared for us. Help us not to fall into the old mindset. Give us victory as we walk in this new life that you have given. Thank you so much for your mercy and for your grace that free us to serve you out of a love for you. Not because we're trying to earn some a favor. Help us to live in a way that is in accordance with your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.